Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 342 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. Super thrilled that you are here with me today as we are talking to Peggy Ornstein, who is my new BFF. Honestly, I loved her book. It's a subject near and dear to my heart, that of fiber arts, knitting. Um, don't go away, Peggy. It, even if you have never thought about a fiber art, Peggy and I talk about the craft of writing in a delicious way. She is awesome. And you are going to love this interview. I am so excited to present it to you. We are talking about such things as how to find the actual joy in your writing and starting where you can and continuing where you can in your manuscript when you are having those stumped days. We talk about finding the right anecdotes. She is uh, so knowledgeable and so smart about all of this stuff. You're going to love it. What is going on around here? This is going to be the quickest update ever. I am in moving hell. We move in 25 hours and they're still packing to be done. Yeah, if you're watching on the video, you can see my plants behind me because I'm taking these babies over in my own arms. They are not getting taken by a mover, but we are so stressed out. <laughs> it's awful. I hate it. I hate it. I, 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 I just want to run away. That's where I am in this process. Um, that is how it's going. So I'm going to stop gibbering and just jump right into the interview because you don't need me to gibber at you. Let's talk about Peggy. Peggy Ornstein is the New York Times bestselling author of eight books, including Boys and Sex, Girls and Sex, and Cinderella Ate My Daughter. Her newly released memoir is Unraveling, What I Learned About Life While Shearing Sheep, Dying Wool, and Making the World's Ugliest Sweater. A frequent contributor to the New York Times, Peggy has written for such publications as the Washington Post, the Atlantic, New York, and the New Yorker, and has contributed to NPR's All Things Considered and PBS NewsHour. Her TED Talk, What Young Women Believe About Their Own Sexual Pleasure, has been viewed over 5.8 million times. You are going to love this interview. Here we go. When I come back next week, hopefully I will be in a different space and um, maybe a little bit less all over the place. Um, who is not all over the place is Peggy. Here we go. Please enjoy and happy writing to you, my friends. Well, I could not be more pleased to welcome you to the show today. Hello. Will you please give us your name and your pronouns? I am Peggy Ornstein and uh, she, her. Peggy, thank you for being here. I don't know when I was last most excited to have someone on the show. <sighs> I devoured your book, Unraveling consumed me for the two and a half days it took me to read it. And I absolutely loved it. I confess to you in an email that um, had I not loved you and your writing so much, I'll, like from that book, I would have been desperately jealous because it's so <laughs> beautiful. It is a beautiful book about, mm. not just about the pandemic and fiber arts and all of the things that I love, but also really a consideration on, you know, aging and moving forward in our lives and being the similar places, you and I. And I have a bunch of questions for you, but I would love to start off by asking, um, I guess, how, <laughs> you're going to be so irritated with me. How do you do it? How do you combine deeply uh, researched work with exactly the right amount of memoir mixed in? I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I always feel with my books that I would love to be able to say, like, I think every time I do one, I think, okay, I remember how I did this. So that next time I will know how I did this. But there's something that happens at some point. I don't know if you have this where I just... I don't know. It, something takes over. And then when I'm done, I have no idea. how. It's like, there, there's a book, there's not a book. And then there's a book. And I don't know how I got from point A to point B. So then when I go to point A again for the next book, I think, uh oh, <laughs> I don't know how I get to point B every, like every single time. Every single um, time. I always say that I, I know how to do revision and I always know how to revise because there's a set of tools I use for revision, but writing the first draft of a book, it's always like, I've never done it before ever. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's always new. It's always that way. And, and I don't know, I mean, I think a certain amount of that sort of toggling back and forth between, you know, history and memoir and um, other things is, you know, it's something I've always done. And it's something that I learned as a um, periodical journalist. Oh, wait, that's weird. Siri suddenly wanted to talk to me there. Wait, let me turn her off. Um, <laughs> I wonder what, so, I wonder what she wanted to say to us. I don't know. She just wanted to, <laughs> wanted me to find, sometimes she just randomly goes on. Um, <laughs> Um, wait, I'm just trying to figure out how to make the do not disturb thing happen. How do I make the do not disturb thing happen? There it is. Okay. Um, periodical. Yeah, journalism. I just, I, I think that, that working for, um, magazines kind of teaches you how to do that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And also a really, I have a really, um, one of my feelings about writing is that I always feel that I'm like a fellow traveler mm -hmm. with my readers. And so um, when I'm writing about things that are complicated, or, you know, I've written a lot about cancer and the science around cancer or infertility or, um, you know, sexual consent or all of these things, I sort of assume that if I can sort of explain it to myself, I can maybe explain it to somebody else, but I never act like I'm sort of above or no more. And so my own process becomes really um embedded in the in all of it always so so it's always kind of rated in there along the way my own reactions and my own ideas and such you have the perfect touch and the perfect balance because I read a lot of straight up nonfiction and I read a lot of memoir and it's like you know the peanut butter and the chocolate getting together yeah. uh, oftentimes I am frustrated because this this nonfiction writer didn't put any of herself in and this memoirist was just you know all feelings which is I think where I always lean but you're you're just smack dab in the exact place my brain always wants to read oh. and I just couldn't believe it I loved this book and we oh have talked gosh, a little bit offline you. about how uh, I cannot believe we don't know each other Christine Vajar is a friend of mine all oh. you know all of these people that you were dropping in the book in the fiber arts, um, in the Bay Area, we lived kind of these parallel lives. Um, yeah, weird, huh? yeah, super, super, super. But you're cool. younger. You're now, younger is there? I am not. I'm only. I'm fifty, so I'm only a few years younger than you. Um, is there a picture of the sweater that you made anywhere? Okay, so yes, isn't it on the back of the book? I didn't get the back. You of the got book. the book. I got the neck alley. So maybe I oh, couldn't oh, oh, see it. Oh. This is what, okay, um, perfect. It's on the back of the book, but also I I would hold it up for you, except that somebody took it to photograph it and they haven't given it back. And I'm getting a little, ad this is Ooh. exactly why I didn't want to give it to somebody to photograph. Yes, you must get it back soon. Will you please talk yeah. to us about the premise of this book? Oh, well, so the through line was, it was sort of, I guess the, the occasion for the book was, a long held fantasy. I mean, the, you know, I had been out, I just had in tw January, 2020, I was like the last author. To, I feel like I was the last author to go out on book tour on the road. basically ever um, yeah. because they don't do them anymore. And I, I went on this tour for boys and sex, which had just come out. And, um, and I was um, really, you know, running around doing media, going to bookstores, meeting people, shaking hands, you know, it, it was fantastic. And just moving to the point where I was going to start doing, you know, uh, like speaking gigs instead of the book tour part. Um, and then there was this, I don't know if you know, Rachel, but um, there was a pandemic. Um, <laughs> Wait, hmm. <laughs> maybe you missed it. <laughs> and everything went like, you know, ground to a halt. And suddenly I was just like, like all of us, you know, worried, well, sitting in my house um, with nothing to do. And uh, I started thinking, well, what am I going to do? And I, and I thought I would um, do this long held um, that I've had a long held fantasy. And I thought my publisher would really laugh at me. I mean, when I asked them about this, I said it in the tiniest voice, because I just thought she's going to make fun of me um, of wanting to, uh, I'm a life, a, a lifelong knitter, basically. And I wanted to go from sheep to sweater to just have like the experience of learning to shear sheep, um, processed fleece, dye using natural spin it dye using natural dyes and make the whole thing into a sweater just kind of it was you know and really had not considered very much what all that would entail 
Um, mm -hmm. But everybody was off baking sourdough at that point and everything. So it seemed actually quite of the, of the moment of the zeitgeist. So that was what I decided to do. Um, but I used that as an occasion uh, and, and, you know, as you're talking about that, there's, there's always sort of a braiding of ideas in with books for me uh, to um, also think about um, that I was in midlife, really moving towards the end of that, um, that I, my daughter was uh, applying for college. So we were thinking about the empty nest, um, thinking about, you know, thinking about aging, thinking about the next steps in life, um, the climate crisis. I lived up in the Berkeley Hills, which, were, you know, the whole state was on fire. Uh, when I was reading about raging. that, when you were knowing exactly where you were up, off of Grizzly Peak, I was so worried about you. So glad that you moved. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel, I feel bad because now I've written all this. And of course, lots of people still live up there. Of course, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to put a knock on living up there, but um it, it was really stressful during 2020 to, as the state was burning down to live yeah. in a high risk fire zone. So climate anxiety and pandemic and all of these things were sort of like whirling along. Um, and then also my, my dad, um, who was back in Minneapolis where I grew up was, um, was his dementia was getting worse. We couldn't go see him. So all of these things were sort of going on. Um, and as I was going through this process and then also creativity and women's lore and history and, um, trying to bring all that together underneath the through line and thread of creating this garment from nothing. Mm. And the imagery that you use, the facts you give to us, I've read all the, I've read all the knitting books, all the knitting memoirs, and you taught me things. You taught me things. Facts I had never heard of or thought of were jumping off the page at me. And I loved, especially when you were learning to shear the sheep <laughs> and they're on your, I've always thought that that looks like one of the hardest things in the world. And one of my, oh my one of my core memories is, uh, you know, going to an uncle's sheep farm here in New Zealand when I was a kid and they have these, um, wool shoots that are long slides, yeah. basically the shearer shears and then chucks the, the, the fleece down this chute into a huge room where the, the, they would stay until they were, you know, the dags were cleared off and they were processed mm -hmm. or thrown away, but, um, they would also throw us kids down there. They were just, you know, it was our slide and we just slide down and land in the fleece and then run up this, run up the ladder and do it all over again. Wow, um, but I always fun. thought it, it was great. It was great. I still, I, that's why I think I love the smell so much, but it looks so hard and you proved it was hard. So hard. <laughs> Hardest thing I'd ever done. Not, I didn't know, I was like, didn't even think about it. Just thought, oh yeah, of course I can do this thing that you know, is there, there's a, what, like 120 or 150 pound animal with hooves that doesn't want to be hooves. there. And you've got a hot, whirring, sharp blade that has no safety on it. Without a guard. And I had no idea without it a guard. have a guard, but of course it doesn't have a guard. No, oh my God. it doesn't have a guard. No. <laughs> and, and it's, it's, it's in, and you're, it, I can't even emphasize how difficult <laughs> um, this was, and after I did, it took me an hour and a half to shear my first sheep, which by comparison, those guys in New Zealand are doing it in two minutes, yeah. a sheep basically, yeah. um, at the, at the max. And my teacher, who was a young woman named Laura said, you know, hey, you know, you're a natural at this. And I was like, I am not a natural. And she said, oh yeah, most people might now would be swearing or crying and you're not. I was like, the only reason I am not swearing, crying and stalking away is that I'm writing a book and it would look really bad if I gave up. So I'm forcing myself to keep it. Boy, did I want to walk away. Um, so I sheared three uh, sheep in the end. And then the last one was, I mean, I did it so badly. And, and, you know, I will say a badly shorn sheep makes badly spun yarn makes a pretty messed up sweater but you know we did it i did it you did it you I actually did it. did it and you wrote yeah. an incredibly gorgeous book that i truly loved and i can't wait to tell people about i would love to talk to you about your writing process because you mm -hmm. are a virtuoso at this what does your writing process look like on uh, there is no there are no normal there are no normal days left but on a kind of normalish day what does your writing day look like well so you know because of what because I'm a nonfiction writer, I'm not always writing on a writing day. Mm -hmm. I might yep. be out reporting. I might be researching. I could be doing any number of things. Um, I'm also a great procrastinator and I can spend, you know, I, like <clears throat> if it takes me two years to write a book, I'm spending one year 
playing spelling bee or you know, <laughs> writing email or yeah, there's a way that I wish I wrote. There's like, I wish I could tell you, I sat down with my tea and I wrote my morning pages and then I immediately jumped in. But no, you know, I do, I, I do the New York times spelling bee and wordle. And then I kind of look at some email and then I think, Oh, I really should be, you know, so it's like, I'm, I'm kind of not, but, but I also learned to feel after a long time that procrastination was part of the process. Mm. And so when I have friends who are writers, especially newer writers who say, oh, I just, you know, all I did was sharpen pencils for four hours today. Oh no. I say, you know what? That is part of it. And you have to get to the point where the doing is less painful than the not doing in order to, mm. to get yourself past that. Is that mm-hmm. the right way around with that? Yeah. To get yourself past that hump. You know what I mean? Um, I love that. But I also, I do sit down. I, ooh, I mean, I, this is my job. Um, and it's always been my job. I've always been, an, I was an editor for a few years, but I've, I've been a writer for a long time. Um, it's how I make my living. And so there is the, the, the aspect of if I don't write, I don't eat. It's very powerful. Um, so I will eventually kick in. And I always think about Anthony Trollope, you know, Anthony Trollope was a mm-hmm. banker, but before he went to the bank every day, he would write for like three hours. Like he just sat down and he wrote and, you know, in this really disciplined way. So I kind of aspire to be, to work like a normal person, you know, to work like a really normal person, to just get up, sit down, work, work a work day, and then walk away like people who work in a bank. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I will say that you say that about your procrastination and I know that it is true. And you came up with this challenge after the pandemic began and it is going to be published less than three years before after the pandemic yep. began because it comes out in January. We're going to be hitting mm-hmm. our three-year anniversary of the pandemic in March. So that's pretty amazing to do all the work of the sweater, write the book, which is beautiful, do all the research get it done. So you're, um, I think the wordling and the, and the spelling bee are not getting in the way too much, honestly. Yeah, no, but I, and I, and I do really, I do work like it's a job and my, I'm actually, my husband is a documentary filmmaker. Um, and he too works like that. He, um, you know, he, he goes to his office, does his work at dinner time. we're done. Um, and we really try to sort of have a, um, have always tried to have a sort of normal scheduled life like that. We're not people who work in the middle of the night or anything like that. Yeah, I'm not either. And I take weekends off. I only work yeah. during the week. Every once in a while, if there's well, something, you know, pressing, you have I to can do it, pretty but... easily, you know, it's in the computer. I didn't used to, like when I first started, but in the internet era, it's really easy to just bleed yeah. into all time, you know, because yeah. the computer's always there. Your phone's always there. So you always, I don't know, it, it just keeps you connected to work too, in a way that I yes. can't wish it didn't. The way that I hate. Ah. Mm-hmm. All right. So what is your I, I want to say yeah, one other thing about that though, because I'm also a, a working mom. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really important thing to acknowledge. I do only have one child or did you know, she's out of the house now. But um for me, the other piece that has been really vital is that my partner, my husband, um was as both valued my work and my contribution mm-hmm. to our life both financially and creatively, um, and also uh, was willing to and, and wanted to be a, a full-on parent in mm. the same way that I was. And so that I didn't have that inequity that a lot mm. of women struggle with, um, where they're doing everything with the kids and everything in the home. And then on top of that, you're supposed to write. I mean, that is really, really hard. Um, and I didn't, I didn't have to um, struggle with that. I'm very glad you didn't have to struggle with that. And I appreciate you saying that because I know that there are listeners of the show who do struggle with that on a daily basis. Yeah. And it's and that. it's really easy not to forgive yourself, to feel like you should be able to, on top yeah. of you know everything else you're doing, carve out space and time so that you, even if nobody else, values your writing work. And I think if you can't right now that you should forgive yourself for that and and understand that there's a lot of forces that are, that are pressuring you in different directions. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. What is the biggest challenge when it comes to you as a writer? Um, Writing. (laughs) (laughs) That's the worst. And I know it's true. Yeah. You know, well, it's funny. I just, today I was looking for some document that I lost on my computer. And uh, 
I don't know exactly what I was looking for, but I, this thing, you know how you have like a million years of stuff on your computer and you don't even know it's there anymore. And this document came up that was called um, the anxiety of authorship. Ooh. I know. And I thought, what's that? <laughs> I don't remember that. Uh, and it turned out to be something from like more than tw- like 25 years ago. Um, and it was uh, about a conference that uh, Judith Thurman, who, who was a biographer, she wrote Cleopatra's Nose yeah. and biographies of Chanel. And um, she coined that term at this conference that was about the anxiety specifically that women writers get um, around. And she said, like, there's not a, a nerve in her writer's body that isn't always completely tense at all times, whether at mm-hmm. every stage of creation. Um, and there were all these writers who were taught, women writers, and they were saying that women in, that while all writers um, experience anxiety, that women experience it earlier in the process and are mm-hmm. more likely to freeze up and also um, be more anxious about the value of their their ideas in the first place. Mm. And, and I really identified with that. And I re- was remembering years ago reading um, about the, the dearth of women on editorial pages in newspapers Mm -hmm. and I don't know if there's still this level of inequity or if it's been addressed more but at the time there was the sexism but there was also women um we have a tendency to you know think oh I don't know if anybody really wants to hear up from me on this I don't have the level of the requisite level of expertise maybe I shouldn't do it and by the time you've thought all that through um, plus put dinner on the table, you know, it's it's too late and, and the moment has passed and you can't write about it. And I used to, when I was young, I had a boyfriend um, who like, anytime he had a thought, he would turn it into an editorial. And I would think, who do you think, you know, like, how could he think he, anybody cared what he had, but, but he published them all the time in the times and the Washington post, you know, and I'm just saying to go, how do you do that? Because I would sit there and think, oh, nobody really wants to, I don't have the right to, you know? And, and so I thought a lot about that. And so one challenge for me was getting past that and just Mm -hmm. kind of training myself to believe I had the right to speak Mm -hmm. and the right to write. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think another sort of overarching challenge for me is my approach as a nonfiction writer um, is that I go in with curiosity and a hunch, but I don't tend to have a thesis. I think more maybe in my first book I did, but like with say girls and sex and boys and sex, Girls and Sex being the first one. I didn't have any agenda when I went in on that book. I just was sort of like, I think something might be interesting in this area. I don't know. I'm going to go talk to some people. And so there's a desire, I think, or at least I feel a desire to um, find the thing as fast Mm -hmm. as possible Mm -hmm. and not stay open Mm -hmm. and not stay curious because you want to solve the problem and you want to have the thesis and you want to know what you're going to know and know what you're going to write. Um, and so to force yourself not to foreclose that and to close that down, to force yourself to stay open and have the anxiety really of thinking, I have no idea what I'm going towards. I have no idea if there's anything here. I have no idea what I'm going to find or what I'm going to write about. Um, it always seems obvious in retrospect. Uh, and that's part of that, like, um, amnesia of, I don't know how the book got here, but when I'm working on a project, I really don't know what. I'm going to be writing about. And that's really, really scary. And that's really a challenge not to say, um, you know, okay, this is what I'm going to do and just like, stop. So interestingly, I I think I could, I could feel that in this book that you allowed yourself that, that space, because you had a project, you had the through line. Um, But as you move through time in the book, Things were coming up and you were allowing them to be affected by the through line and, you know, like your dad and your daughter and the house and all of those things were really, you, you didn't, I could tell that you weren't closed, that you were allowing those things in around this book and they fit into the book perfectly. And in a way that perhaps you didn't know when you started that this would be an exploration of life stages and how we change and grief and, and all of that. And it, and it works beautifully. Thanks. Well, yeah. I mean, when my agent read it, when it was done, she said, I, I just thought you were going to write about, <laughs> yeah. about, about making a sweater. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that would be 20 pages. That's an article. <laughs> you know, I just, I don't, <laughs> I didn't know where I was going to go. Yeah. Again, I didn't know where I was going to go. And now there's also ways that I look at it and think, oh, there's other things I could have done. 
I did worry that I wasn't going to find it or that I was, you know, that I needed to close it down. So, you know, you also always kind of look and go, oh, now I see, I actually could have gone deeper in this direction and deeper in that mm. direction, but it's fine that I didn't too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of um, faith and I can't even faith, I think discipline mm. to just say, I'm going to, I'm going to let this unfold and see what happens and not, I do worry about it, but not let that worry for, you know, make you prematurely stop your process. That's an interesting juxtaposition too, of the discipline of allowing. I really, really like that. What is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? Oh, you know, I think, I imagine that for every writer, it's that moment when you've got that flow going, you know, I mean, I think that people think that the big joy is publishing or the big joy is, you know, hitting the best sell. I mean, it's exciting, um, but you have no control over how, how or whether a book sells. Mm-hmm. I think you recently did something on this that yeah. um, nobody knows how to sell a book. Nobody knows how to market a book. You can write a great, and I tell this to people all the time when I give advice, I just say, you have to write the book you'll enjoy having on your shelf because yeah. I used to say, you know, you never know, there could be a plane crash. There could be a, um, you know, I had a book that came down, out when the, not that it should be about me, but the twin towers fell. And that was, you know, I mean, th- stuff happened. I hadn't actually thought, you know, global pandemic would be one of those things, but now it's not hard yeah. to, now it's not hard for people to understand when I say that, Yeah, yeah. that yeah. stuff can happen. And it doesn't matter how good your book is. It just, isn't going to sell that day and, or that year. So, so that's not, that can't be, even though it's important and great and, and you want people to read it and you want that audience that can't be the, um, the thing that brings you the most joy because it's unlikely. Mm -hmm. So you have to have the joy has to be, and this was one of the things that really, um, I think I got back to a lot through doing this book. There's, there's a chapter on blue in the book. And I talk a lot in that chapter about, process and learning to get past um I used to have this Linda Berry cartoon in my office uh where she talks about how we learn as children how we're so creative like naturally creative everybody is and then at some point you learn the two questions which is um am I good and does this suck and those then undermine and and freeze you up and, and undermine your creativity and I think the moments when you can um shut those down and just be in the doing um, are the moments of, of real joy and excitement. And, and actually in that blue chapter, the opening, I think my favorite part of this book is the opening of the blue chapter um, where I, I sort of go into it sideways where I'm talking about my dad, as I mentioned, he, he was, he had dementia um, and uh, he, he died recently, but I was, he was alive through the book. Um, and thank you. And uh, he, he, uh, couldn't remember a lot of really basic things, um, but he knew the lyrics to every single song that he ever knew as a young person, like every, you know, um, won't you come home, Bill Bailey or whatever the heck it was he was singing (laughs) when in 1940, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I started writing about how music, you know, has that quality of bringing you back, bringing you into this, who you were when you first heard that music and how for me that core album is Joni Mitchell's Blue. And through kind of writing about blue and the idea of Joni Mitchell and the, you know, how blue is a concept and blue is a process and blue is a rhythm and blue is a spirit, I get sort of back around finally to the idea of blue as a dye or a pigment. Mm-hmm. Um, but that section of just writing about remembering the Joni Mitchell album and remembering how I feel and rem- and, the, and what the color blue, how it infused my life. Um, that felt so great to write. And every time I read it, I just think, yeah, that that's one of those times where I really said what I wanted to say. Yeah. Um, so that's kind and of And it felt so great to read that, that motion, that, that, that movement is, is evident. I also loved that chapter. And also I didn't, I mean, I know a lot about indigo dying and I didn't know that it's a pigment, not a dye. I, I mean, just you blew, you, you blew my mind too. <laughs> no, in so many, di- no pun intended. Can you share a craft tip with our listeners of any sort? Um, about knitting? No. <laughs> <laughs> Either. Both. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You know what? The, I think that for me, you know, when we were talking about the writing and how you write books and, and 
I don't, like I said, I, I can never quite remember, but what I do know is this, is that I always start where I can. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily, I don't necessarily start with chapter one or start with the introduction. In fact, I usually write introductions last. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And sometimes I'll write them like, or I'll write them, you know, because there's a tendency to want to put every, if you start with the introduction, to try to put everything in it. And um, you can't. So you don't know what you what it is that needs to be there until you know what it is that you said. Uh, and so um, I'm trying to think of where I started with this book. I feel like I started, um, well, this book I started, I think, on chapter two. I think I started with Shearing. Um, that would make it sense. Fun. It was boots on the ground. Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> um, but like with boys and sex, um, which was about um, young men's attitudes and experience and expectations around um, sex. Um, and I, this, I just, the chapter that I started with was pornography mm -hmm. because that was the chapter I could write. Mm -hmm. I knew I could write that chapter. And once I sort of got going on that chapter, I could work back to the beginning and, and out mm -hmm. to the end um, and sort of do that. And so I, you know, people think a lot of times that you have to start at the beginning and you really don't mm -hmm. have to start at the beginning. Maybe you want to start at the end, you know, mm -hmm. but certainly you can start at the middle. And then as you work forward and backward, you can, which again was sort of like making the blue, you know, when I was dying mm -hmm. with indigo, I was trying to make a series of um, colors, which I think you can see on the wall behind me. Oh, right I see. Uh, you yes. can see some of them. Yes. Yeah. Um, Gorgeous. But um, the, uh, they would change the the relationship to each of them would change as I as I died more and so I would go back to the be, you know back back two spaces forward two spaces back five spaces back to the beginning over to the end because you're sort of trying to get this equilibrium and I think the same is true with writing you know I would start in the middle and then go oh I see now I'm starting with the chapter on pornography but it turns out that this piece actually needed to go in chapter one and that's okay you just move it later to chapter one but yeah. you just have to kind of start where you can start where you can and building on that continue where you can I have a lot of students who yeah. will get who will get stuck. And they, I know they get, they get irritated with me when I say like, well, then what can you see? What can you see yeah. next? Go write that and come back. And yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's, that is exactly right. And I, and I would say the only, the other thing, well, maybe I'll get to that later. Come on. I'm not going to say that, now, but yeah. All right. Um, what is the kindest thing that anyone's ever done for you in your writing career? You know, I was thinking about this. I can't say that I came up in a very kind time. Oh, um, I hate that. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I started my career at Esquire magazine yeah. as a 21 year old woman working in a men's magazine. And it was just, it was, it was not an easy path. Um, there was an editor there though, named Betsy Carter, who's became sort of a legendary editor who, who said to me and she's then she went on she kind of spun off and started this mag, short-lived magazine called new york woman and she said okay you're going to write a feature and this is the feature you're going to write and and she just she just insisted that i do it mm -hmm. and and it was funny because the feature was um about I, I there's nothing about it at the time that in that would indicate i should do it but it ended up um, being really resonant through the rest of my themes and the rest of my life. So it was about a um, Japanese journalist named Atsuko Chiba, who um, did a lot of personal writing and ended up documenting her um, decline and death from breast cancer mm. at the age of 40 something. And I was at the time, I don't know, what was I, 24 or something like that. These were not relevant factors in my life. But later I would go on to marry a Japanese American guy. I'd spend a ton of time in Japan. I had breast mm -hmm. cancer twice. I'm like, how did she know? Um, and wow. wrote about it, you know? Yeah. yeah freaky, huh? Yeah. Um, that is a gift. Yeah. So, but Betsy really, you know, was like, you are going to write, this is what you're going to write. And, and then I was thinking, this isn't kind exactly, but I was thinking about ad good advice I got. And I remembered, you know, this, and this sort of was what I was going to say before, because it kind of speaks to a challenge, but it also speaks to advice that the difference between, for me, writing um, something that I report, that's purely, you know, that's a reported piece, and memoir, is that when I write a reported piece, uh, what I have is my transcripts and my interviews and my stuff, and that's it, boom, boom, you know? 
for better or for worse. You got to make that work. Mm -hmm. When you're writing memoir, you have everything in your head, everything in your life. It's like infinite. And how do you choose the one thing that's going to stand in for like an entire series of anecdotes and life experiences? It's really, and and so when I wrote my, I I wrote a previous memoir called Waiting for Daisy that was about um, the years I spent trying to have my child and infertility and cancer and all these things that were going on at that point in my life. Which as your newest, Um, biggest fan, I cannot wait to read, by the way, please continue. It's so long ago, but yeah. And also I I always want to say, I'm not as crazy as Peggy in that book. And (laughs) Stephen is not as saintly as Stephen in that book. Um, Noted, noted. (laughs) Just so you know. But uh, though he would say yes. Um, But when, so when I was writing that book, I was just completely paralyzed um, because I did not know how to do it. And Stephen, again, you know, who is in a similar kind of field, uh, he said, well, you know, at one point I had had all these you know, multiple miscarriages, multi, you know, just like really like a long string of bad luck and difficulty and then ca- cancer and all this stuff. And so he said, why don't you go back to the therapist that you were seeing um, through part of that? Not because I think you need to be in therapy right now, but because therapists like writers are trained to extract a narrative of meaning. Mm. And so perhaps if you go back to the therapist with your, uh, with a recorder, um, and you record some sessions. You'll and tell the try to talk to her about what's important and what the story is. That you'll find those anecdotes because they'll be the ones that you tell her. Oh wow! And I know that is he has smart. no memory of this. He always says, "I never said that." You're making oh. that up. And I'm like, "I am not making it up." Take the you know, take the credit. And so I did. And I went back. I don't even not very many times, like maybe three times. And I'm not yeah. sure I ever even transcribed what I recorded. Um, but it broke the you know, it broke the block. And I did figure out through those conversations um, oh, what is lovely. I needed to emphasize. Oh, yeah, that is. So that's kind really of, I don't know if that's right. a tip or if that's a kindness or if that's a it's challenge, or, but, it's, it's but it was, it was a really cool, I mean, I think of all my experiences of somebody saying anything to me as a writer, um, that it was one of the most profound. And he really, really gets it. He really gets it. I guess yeah. he does. Yeah. Yeah. According yeah. to him. I mean, according <laughs> to me. I don't know about it. What is the kindest thing you've ever done for yourself as a writer? Um, you know, I mean, I think with, with this book, it was letting myself have fun mm. um, at a time that was really hard, you know, yeah. when there was so much that was scary and boring and um you know, sad. Um, so I think taking a break from the more serious kinds of books that I was doing and and doing something that, that I could enjoy. And also, you know, I think again, and again, going back to that blue chapter, which was so central to me, um, learning through this book, reminding, you know, I think when you are a professional writer, when you make your living doing this, you can lose some things. And, and you become very um, aware of marketplace and what might sell and what you need to do to stay relevant and stay ahead and make an income and all of these things. Um, and it's not that it ever became so much about that, but I think you lose some joy in process. Um, and so reconnecting through this book and through doing these tasks. I mean, I think one of the things that was beautiful for me mm-hmm. about doing these things was I really was never going to be good at them, right? I was never, right. I mean, maybe if I did them for a long time, but I was never going to be even proficient, you know, let alone yeah. professional. So just letting yourself be a rank amateur yeah. and finding and re- and watching myself and seeing how often, and I do this in the book a bunch before I kind of finally come to, oh, I need to be enjoying process. And I'm like, ugh you know, I'm just awful at this. I'm so like uh, with Christine, who you said, you knew when I'm learning to spin, I'm like, oh, I just can't do it. It's been a half hour. And I'm like, oh, I can't even do it. I'm I'm never going to be able to do this. And so kind of learning to not only live with that frustration, but, in, but, but stop being so focused on um, what the result needs to be and to have a little bit of space in a, in a life that where, where I have been lucky enough to be able to make this my living um, but that that comes with a certain 
pressure and a certain cost and to be able to just set that aside for a minute mm. um, was, was really kind of a gift to myself. I love that you say that. And interestingly spinning, um, I was taught by Janine Bages. I don't know if you know her, but she's a knit color fiber guru who also lives in Berkeley. Mm. Um, and she taught me how to spin in her living room. And I just remember being so furious for the first 30, 45 minutes, an hour. And, and, uh, and when it started to come together, you know, I, I loved it. And it's still remains, spinning still remains one of the few things that I am just completely pleased to be a rank beginner. I've spun multiple I sweaters. Worth of, I don't care. I don't care if it comes out lumpy, clumpy. I don't care. I love yeah. all of the stuff that I have spun. Yeah. I don't ever need to know exactly how the, the different gears work in terms of ratios. I don't care. It's yeah. just something that is still so meditative. Spinning Knitting is, has never been med meditative, but spinning is to me. Spinning is yeah. so meditative. And I thought I, I kept, you know, I say that when my, when my hands spun, my mind stopped spinning. Yes. You um, said that. I love pandemic, that. You know, yes. And I just, I found it to be, yeah, really enjoyable, really, you know, tactile, just fun and meditative. And I just didn't care what became of it. I just yes. liked sitting there. I just was, I, I never had to use it. Never had to, I just liked spinning. Yes. Um, so I think about that because I still have my wheel. I haven't been using it, but I do enjoy that spinning. I thought the whole, like, the, yeah, I, I, I loved that. I think. Well, everything was fun. The dying was fun too. I mean, that had its own, you know, just being able to suddenly look at the world and see that every single thing might make a color, you know, and you're just walking around your neighborhood and going, wow, you know, what if I put that into a pot and boiled it with that? What color would that turn? And, and the fact you know, that you, I never, I had never known that artificial dyes hadn't been in existence until what was it like 1837 or something like that? Incredibly late like yeah. when that guy accidentally discovered it and before fuchsia. that everything was natural natural everything was natural oh. and then in like an instant i mean it's so it's again there was so much in this book um in, that resonated with the current moment in our current state um whether it was you know issues around race issues around gender issues around labor issues around technology and the when they when this guy stumbled on um chemical dye uh, for the and and that then within ten years, natural dye was gone, gone. And all that yes. lore, everything that people knew, um, it was gone. And it was just like you know, it, it was so much like technology today, yeah. where they just like something comes in and suddenly everything you know like like everything is gone. They they disrupt yeah. it and it's gone. And yeah. and you know we writers start feeling like gee. You know, <laughs> you feel like a little bit like I kind of make a joke that I'm fascinated with these careers of bygone times because I feel like I'm getting to be like a lamplighter or a, you know, or a blacksmith or a Gandhi dancer. Um, <laughs> these things that don't exist anymore uh, yeah. because technology made them obsolete in some way. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, it was it was really interesting. Uh, I can't remember uh. where I started on that. I, um, doesn't matter. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, speak, so your book was the best book that I've most recently read. What is the best book that you've most recently oh. read? Um, I think Ruth Ozeki's book of form and emptiness. And you I haven't one? read it yet, but I do love her. I am a huge Ruth Ozeki fan. Um, you know, almost like Stephen King misery level. <laughs> And this oh. one I loved because it has, you know, her, her, I mean, she's just a wonderful writer. She has a great way with words. She's very funny. Um, and she has just a hint of magical realism, which I generally mm. speaking, don't like that much, yeah. but in her case, I feel like it really always works. And she also, she's a Buddhist priest in addition to being a writer. And so you see those values and ideas um, pervading mm. her work and, uh, and then the the kind of um, at the center of this book is um, a teenage boy who whose father dies and he's hearing inanimate objects talk, mm -hmm. um, starting with the book itself that you're reading and telling him what to do. And it's questioning this idea of whether that makes him crazy or whether that makes him actually just more aware and real than the rest of us. And I have always suspected that inanimate objects are talking to us. Me too. So, Especially the houses. You really feel right? the houses. Yeah. 
you know they're trying to talk. So like the fact yeah. that this kid could hear them, I thought, yeah, there's actually, I don't know. Do you know the podcast? Um, oh, shoot. No, I'm forgetting the name of it. It's a podcast where inanimate objects, they interview inanimate objects. No, but that sounds wonderful. Um, it's not, it's alive. Ugh, I can't remember the name of it. You can, but, It'll but be yeah, it's there. Yeah. They're, um, it's un, I think it's probably semi-scripted, you know, the inanimate objects are yeah. presumably voiced by actors. Um, and I say semi-scripted because I feel like there's things that happen in every episode that are the same sort of, but that they also are clearly improvising and they have things like a Coke can or a doll or a street lamp or all these different things. And they're just fantastic. So that's that not a book, lovely. It just played into the whole, like, I just feel like I, it was one of those books that I walk around and I think differently. So I look at, you know, I'll look at my picture frame and think, I wonder what that picture frame might say to me if it could be speaking. Mm. So I love books. I do that. And that makes me want to be kinder to everything and everyone. Yeah. So, thank you. I will be, I will be looking that well, up. I did okay. used to have a yeah. little bit of a thing with, Anna. I don't know if you did that. When I was a kid, I was afraid that the stuffed animals in my bed would come alive at night and kill me. Um, <laughs> As one is, aren't we all a little? So I would always say goodnight to them very nicely, every single one personally, and then put in the closet and lock the door. <laughs> See, and I went the, I, 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 I know what you're saying, but I just thought that they were going to say bad things about me. So I would be oh. really, really nice to them and make sure I was nice to them <laughs> equally so that they, when I went to sleep, they wouldn't gossip about me. Oh. I would be less concerned. <laughs> now I would be less concerned. They can go write bad reviews. I don't care. That's <laughs> yeah. lovely. Where can we find you and your book, please? Which will have just come out this week when Yay. I release this episode. Hooray, hooray. Well, gee, I hope you can find the book wherever books are sold. Yes. Um, your nice independent bookstore, local bookstore. And it is called Unraveling. Years. What is the it's subtitle again? Because I'm blanking on it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a great subtitle uh, well maybe i have it called, here somewhere. um what is the subtitle now i'm blanking on it too oh i, I have it right here uh from your publicist subtitles. unraveling what i learned about life while shearing sheep dyeing wool and making the world's ugliest sweater there you go i knew it was something like that <laughs> I was I, I have these I have a tendency to write these incredibly long subtitles and then not be able to remember what they are. Um, <laughs> and yeah. where can we find so, you? Yes, yes, yes. So that is the book, and you can find me. I'm on my website www.peggyuniversity.com on Facebook, on you know, on all the social media. I'm really a terrible social media person, but I I sort of I try once in a while. But I'm there nominally anyway. But thank you, you so much be for being on the show, and thank you for writing a book that I absolutely freaking loved. I am so grateful to you, Rachel. Thank you so much. This was super, super, super fun. I rarely get to talk about writing. So I'm really grateful to you for asking those questions. You're welcome.